So like saying, oh, I achieved 99% accuracy could just be because 99% of the samples you had didn't have cancer and your model is just predicting that there's no cancer. Yeah. So I, you know, in terms of resumes, I don't, I don't like to really see the word accuracy unless it's like associated with a specific metric. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today we have Kyle Crinan. He is a deep learning software engineer at NVIDIA, researching, implementing, and optimizing state-of-the-art distributed deep learning models using mainly PyTorch and TensorFlow. He has a unique combination of skill sets of both hardware and software engineering. Today we'll talk about temporal fusion, transformer, time series, recommenders, and other deep learning research topics, and of course, his career journey. And if you have been enjoying the show, subscribe to the channel, and I would appreciate if you give me a five-star review. Welcome to the show, Kyle. Hey, Diana. It's, it's great to be here. I'm really excited to talk about my work. Yeah. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your career journey? How did you get into machine learning? Uh, wow, that's, that's a long question. So for a little bit of background, I did my bachelor's at the University of California, Berkeley, right across the bay here. Um, I, uh, started out college in the electrical engineering computer sciences program, and I didn't really know what to do. Both my parents were electrical, electrical engineers. I had maybe a single or two internships in high school, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, 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 I'd only done, um, you know, I'd done UI work, which I wasn't a huge fan of. And I'd done some QA work, which I, you know, it was okay. And I, I learned to do some, you know, important things for testing and, and, and ensuring quality, but um, it also wasn't for me. So in my freshman year of college, I got this internship doing data science at a, at a startup that uh, I'd actually, the CEO of that startup had, I'd actually worked as an intern before at his previous company. Yeah. And um, uh, I got introduced to data science. I got introduced to, you know, visualization, modeling for, um, in, in the case of that company, it was for marketing. Um, and I sort of fell in love with uh, the concept of, of data science and especially the, the model side mm -hmm. architecture, figuring out like, how do we build the correct model to match this business need or how to, or this data set or whatever. So off of that, I decided, you know, of the machine learning space and of the, you know, data science space, I, I really got in, in involved with uh, deep learning. I took Andrew Hing's deep learning.ai class. Yeah. Um, and I decided I really wanted to do it. So the following summer, I found a company that was hiring for hardware and software because, you know, I was sort of interested in hardware still at that point doing mm -hmm. uh, deep learning for computer vision. And I worked for them for a summer. I learned a ton and I decided I love software a lot more than I liked hardware for, yeah. for deep learning. Um, and then funnily enough, I ended up going to NVIDIA, a hardware company, uh, but working on software mm -hmm. for, for deep learning. And it's a sort of roundabout way, but I, I got to it mostly through following what I thought I was, I was interested in at the time. Mm -hmm. And I eventually found my, my, you know, final resting place. Yeah, you tried a bunch of things and then figure out that's what you really want. I think that's really cool. And also the things you learned a few years ago might be useful in the future. Maybe you did need to use some UI design skill sets when you build an ML prototype. Oh, abs absolutely. I've, I, I've actually, you know, in my personal projects and a little bit at work, I, mm. I've been able to use that experience. Yeah. Um, but I, in addition, right, like the hardware experience that I gained working at that hardware startup, yeah. working on deep learning, also informs my ability to, or informs me on how to work with, you know, hardware constrained models. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was one of the main reasons I was, I was sort of interesting to NVIDIA. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's quite a journey. So your current title is Deep Learning Software Engineer, and I know a lot of what you do is research. Can you tell us more about what is your role and what is a machine learning or deep learning research do? Yeah, so uh, th that's a great question. Uh, I guess it might make a little bit more sense or, or to give a little bit more context, I, I should talk about my, my team a little bit first. Sure. So my, my team is the, the deep learning algorithms team at NVIDIA. Um, it actually started out as a math libraries team. You know, it was just people working on, you know, how do we do efficient mathematical operations on GPUs? Um, and, you know, in the advent of deep learning around 2014, uh, you know, the business unit realized, 
oh, wow, like deep learning is huge. We need people that with a strong performance and computational background and mathematical, since a lot of deep learning is based on math. Yeah. Um, we need this group. So they, they spun up a team from this math, math libraries team to work on deep learning alg- algorithms. And initially it was, you know, very exploratory, but now it's blossomed into a very large team mm-hmm. that sort of works on the state of the art or works on proving the state of the art for NVIDIA GPUs, right? Like what, 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 what is the max we can push our GPUs to for on, on deep learning tasks? And it also helps inform, you know, NVIDIA what we can do better in, in future hard branch generations, right? So in my role as a researcher, sort of the way that my workflow works, uh, we'll periodically do reviews of contemporary research for different domains. So in my case, you know, we'll do a review of uh, time series models. We'll say, okay, there, there are four models. There's, you know, TFT. Um, there's a new model I just read about like this week called SAF, mm-hmm. which is a, a time series model um, that, you know, we, we, we take a look at them. We look at, you know, conceptually what they bring to the table. Yeah. And then we say, you know, okay, like, what can we do? Well, first of all, we need to prove these models, right? We need yeah. to go in, get, go into the repo, grab the model, test it to verify accuracy and verify performance or, you know, any, any statements that they make, we need to verify them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we can sort of push it a couple of directions. Um, there's the optimization portion of my job, which you mentioned, which is, uh, you know, if a model is performing well accuracy wise, but its performance, that being like its throughput is not that great. Uh, we sort of have to figure out how to improve that, uh, to work best it can on, on NVIDIA GPUs. And that's, mm-hmm. that's a long, complicated process that yeah. we, we can go over a, a, a little bit later. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the, on, the, on the tail end of that, there's also the, the research level. Um, so, you know, after we've, we've reproduced results, um, we, we can sort of take the option to take the research in another direction. We can say, hey, you know, maybe we can remove this layer or uh, we can introduce this other concept that we found in another paper. You know, a great example of this would be in time series work, uh, there's this concept called exponential moving weight av- averaging, mm-hmm. which we call EMA, um, that we found is really, really performant at improving the convergence of time series models. Um, and we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't, you know, said, hey, this this concept seems interesting. Let's apply it to this domain. Mm-hmm. That's basically, from a research perspective, sort of how how my team works, right? Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll, we'll find accuracy, you know, try and get performance to be the speed of light, which is, you know, the fastest a model could be, yeah. um, given the ops in it. And then we will uh, propose novel research directions based on contemporary literature or other papers. Yeah, thanks for sharing your team. Now, uh, what is your responsibility specifically? What is your day-to-day look like? Yeah, so um, my day-to-day is centered around tabular models. Uh, that would be data that can be represented as a series of uh, relational tables in some way. Um, so the bounds of that right now include stuff like time series, recommender systems, uh, graph modeling, which is just a form of relational modeling. Um, and uh, sort of my day-to-day right now um, is centered around uh, proving these models and building tooling to, to, to work with them because some, you know, especially graph modeling mm-hmm. um, is a relatively do, new domain where uh, we don't have the best idea of what the best practices are yet, yeah. right? Um, yeah, the PyTorch Geometric and, and deep, deep Graph Library, DGL, mm-hmm. um, are the two big frameworks in the space and they're constantly changing from yeah. version to version. Right now, it's sort of, my work is sort of centered around, you know, day-to-day, uh, for example, today, working on figuring out um, ways to solve scaling challenges in DGL mm. or ways to, you know, train, effectively train a model, a graph neural network on a graph that doesn't fit into GPU memory mm. or a graph that is almost larger than the the RAM available on a machine. Yeah. Um, those are the sort of challenges I'm working working through day to day right now. But I've gone through a gamut of stuff. I've worked on pre-processing. I've mm. worked on accelerated pre-processing for recommender systems using GPUs. I've worked on um, stuff like, uh, for example, uh, you know, optimizing Mask RCNN when I was an intern. Mm-hmm. I've worked on optimizing other models like uh, Informer, which is a time series model, or or and some of the optimization effort for TFT, uh, Temporal Fusion Transformers, which is another time series model. Um, so it really depends on sort of what we're pursuing at a given moment. Yeah. Um, but generally it's a lot of performance work, taking a look at the, the model, 
you know, running it within a profiler. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that breaks down the model into the base calls to uh, kernels on the GPU. Mm -hmm. um, and then figuring out, oh, are there any blockages, bottlenecks here that we can sort of solve or improve so that the model has better performance on GPU. Yeah, so basically you look at both the model performance metrics like accuracy, precision recall, and other, all that other things like speed, um, how well is it training on the GPUs or other machines? Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really easy, I guess in, it, when I was in college, it was really easy to just say, oh yeah, the, the most accurate model is the, is the best <laughs> yeah. thing. Um, and then you sort of realize that you know, if you have an infinitely large model that can model everything, mm -hmm. but it, you know, only works at one frame a second or, you know, it really takes a long time to process, mm -hmm. that model isn't really useful, right? Like if a model isn't fast and accurate and has low latency, um, we can't really think about using that in production or anyone can't think about using that. In yeah, production. right. So um, I have a question also related to how we met. So we met on LinkedIn. I think you uh, left a comment on my post and I thought, oh, that was so interesting. So I reached out to you. Hey, Kyle, do you want to come yeah. to my podcast? On that post, I wrote, um, sometime is not worth it to spend another three months to just improve 1% of accuracy. There are other things you want to consider. Do you want to launch it earlier so it can provide business value while you are collecting more uh, validation data to improving the model? And then you also mentioned uh, latency and other factors. So my question would be um, whether it's uh, research or model in production, how do you know when a solution is good enough? Like, do you have a weight when you look at accuracy, you know, latency and, uh, you know, cost? How do you combine all the factors together? That's a good question. Um, so my team doesn't always serve, you know, a, a product or a data science need. Uh, we mm -hmm. are, you know, more, a little bit more research focused. We, we work on, uh, I would call them uh, academic data sets, right? Like we'll work on data sets that were provided open source. We're not, they're not being deployed directly into production. But of course, we have to keep this in mind because these models are going to be picked up by other people or customers or, or uh, generally just anyone that wants to yeah. use one of our deep learning models. So we have to sort of think about a, a, a couple of things. And you mentioned most of them, right? We have, you know, accuracy, precision recall, mm -hmm. um, all of the, I, what would I would call them, like evaluation or accuracy metrics. Yeah. Um, and then you also have to worry about straight up performance. How many, how many images per second can your ResNet put mm. out? How many, you know, time series can you process in a given moment? Um, and then you also have to worry about latency. If you're working on an application like uh, recommendation, right? If you're, if you're Facebook and you need to recommend the next series of posts yeah. uh, when someone clicks refresh, you have to do that really quickly. If, mm -hmm. if you don't have a store, of course, right? You yeah. may have a store prepared for them, but uh, you need to also be low latency in that case. And then if you're, you know, additionally, there are even more granular constraints like, oh, we need to run this model within a specific uh, power or storage envelope. Like mm -hmm. if you're running on mobile, you need to be very, the model needs to be very small and it needs to be not as power hungry. Yeah. Um, so deciding what these, you know, uh, I guess acceptance criteria are mm -hmm. uh, is usually pretty hard. Obviously, accuracy is a is a pretty guiding one. If you yeah. make a model very small and and it's not accurate, that's not very useful. Mm -hmm. But you sort of have to set some guidelines for what everything is going to be. So, for example, let's say, oh, I need I need this model to you know finish you know uh, inference in under five milliseconds, mm -hmm. um, and it needs to you know a single GPU needs to support this much performance because right. we know that it, you know, speed of light, it, it, you know, we need to get this percentage of the max performance that we can get out of this model. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of set those as baselines first. Yeah. And then when you're working on accuracy, right, you, you, you sort of, it's, it's, oh, push it as high as you can go while also meeting those constraints. Mm -hmm. um, in the, in the research sense, in, the, in my work, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different um, because if we're recreating papers, we need to match goal accuracy 100. percent Yeah. Um, and then work on performance, and then mm. latency, and, and and the other another. Attribute. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of it. Yeah. Uh, well, if if we re-release a model and it's mm. and it's less accurate yeah. than the than the paper accuracy, there's there's probably a problem there. Yeah. Right? Like we we want to release 
stuff that is reflective of what the state of the art actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so my hierarchy is actually a little bit different than the business hierarchy because okay. there's the business need is different, right? Like mm-hmm. my team's trying to prove that, you know, these models work well in GPU. Yeah. So we need to maintain the same accuracy as stated by these papers. Mm-hmm. But in a business sense, you you probably holding, you know, yourself to the highest accuracy is often, maybe not often, but sometimes a failing endeavor because you're going to end up with something that just isn't deployable in practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a great point. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so we often talked about ways to improve the model um, accuracy. Um, so say if your model accuracy have meet the, your goal, um, what are something usually you do to reduce the uh, latency or improve the other performance? Yeah, so performance is, is usually uh, one of the first things we do, right? Uh, the first thing you'll, you'll sort of do is uh, NVIDIA provides a set of tools open mm-hmm. source. If you're working on GPU, of course, I can't speak to TPU or uh, any of the other accelerators. But uh, if you're working on GPU, we provide mm-hmm. a set of tools open source that allows you to break down your deep learning workflow into the atomic operations mm-hmm. that it's composed of. So this would be like, you know, you, you run this profiler on top of your, your model run. So, you, you know, Python train.py or whatever, yeah. uh, you'll run, uh, you know, uh, NSYS or NVIDIA Insight systems on top of that Python workflow. Mm-hmm. And what it'll do is it'll track the calls to the base kernels, basically the calls to the GPU that say, oh, do this matrix multiplication. Yeah. Um, and you'll take a look at how they fall. Like you'll mm-hmm. get an exact chronology of, you know, this kernel fired here. It took this long to execute. You know, this kernel, you know, uh, fired here. It took this long to execute. Mm-hmm. And you'll you'll generally see a, a pattern for, for how these uh, kernels interact. Like yeah. you may see one blocking another or no, one blocking another. So some of the first things you can do, right? The first thing you're probably going to do is look at, oh, w- what kernel am I using the most time on? Mm. Like, what are, what am I doing that's taking a lot of time? Um, and sometimes these are just, you know, memory, co- in some cases, it's just memory copies, right? Mm. Like, moving data around is actually really computationally expensive, yeah. or at least in terms of time. You know, you, you may want to figure out ways to decrease those memory copies or to, to offload or persist that or mm. use caching to improve that. Um, but you may also run into stuff like, oh, it seems like there's this CPU operation that is happening at the beginning of every batch that corresponds to data loading that's bogging down our model. Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's blocking the model from doing execution. Yeah. Um, maybe we need to take a look at the data loader to improve mm-hmm. it. Or, you know, in another example, uh, maybe you're using a collator that hits CPU and requires a bunch of data movement between yeah. the GPU and the CPU. Mm-hmm. Um, so initially, it's stuff like that. As you get higher, higher and higher performance... Uh, the tricks that you have to use to to keep achieving more performance get yeah. a little bit more complex. Uh, so there's stuff like using fused kernels, which are basically taking two atomic parts and and using the optimized kernel that combines those two parts together, like a uh, you know fused layer norm as an example. Those can also provide some performance impact, but th- that's generally after you've solved a lot of the other issues, like oh my data loader is slow because it's hitting CPU and doing a bunch mm-hmm. of memory memory copies. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of a process where you look at that timeline and you try and figure out what are the blockers in this timeline? What's the bottleneck? Mm-hmm. And then you fix the, fix the hardest, the biggest bottleneck first. And then yeah. you hit another bottleneck mm-hmm. until you're getting very close to speed of light, which is the fastest that we could do all these operations, assuming that we just scrunch them together. Yeah. And then you've sort of hit, you know, oh, the, any further optimization is not going to do much. That's when you know that your model is very performance optimized. Right. So basically, like, I already tried everything. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You tried everything, and it looks like everything. When, when everything on the on the profile looks mm-hmm. like squished together, yeah. Usually, you know, you know, nothing's blocking anymore. Everything's working in tandem. Mm-hmm. We're we're doing, you know, the most we can um, with respect to performance. Um, yeah. Um, cool. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, um, when I was developing uh, models, I think I was focusing more on. The application part, I don't think I'm very familiar with a profiler. Can you tell us more about what is a profiler and uh, give us more examples of um, how you can take advantage of that? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, for those for those viewing at home, uh, you could probably go look up NVIDIA Insight Systems right now. Mm-hmm. And look at a little bit how the system works. Yeah. Um, but generally, 
uh, it's something that you call on your workflow. So you'll have Python trained up high. You'll prepend your call to Insight systems mm -hmm. to before that. That's basically telling your you know your system to uh, essentially track all the the CUDA calls and the CPU calls yeah. uh, that are being run while your model is running. What that's going to do is it's going to run and it's going to sort of pop out a uh, I think it's a QD rep. Uh, it's basically a representation of the workflow in a sort of uh, linear timeline format. Mm -hmm. And you can open that up in a variety of visualiz visualization tools that we provide to sort of show you, oh, these are the, uh, you know, this is the timeline. That was the timeline I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and once you have that, you can do a bunch of different breakdowns. Like you can click into, you can, for example, click into a kernel and see what percentage of the wall clock time that kernel is occupying. So you can say, oh, I, there's there's some kernel here in my ResNet, this conf kernel, maybe mm, I, yeah, I, I can't right. think of any, anything else off the top mm. of my head. There's this conf kernel that's taking 70% of our time. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's something we can do to improve it, or maybe mm. it's being called an error. Um, and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes some models just really, really focus on one type of, of, of kernel op. Mm -hmm. But generally, once you've reached that level, you could start taking a look at the timeline and figuring out where your blockages are. Mm -hmm. Usually a lot when, when we're, we're talking about GPU versus CPU, if you're seeing CPU calls, which you don't have as much information on in, in this profiler, uh, there's probably something that you can do to improve them. In a lot of cases, there's something you can do to improve mm -hmm. them or, or, or decrease reliance on CPU or data movement. And sort of you can use this timeline and these percentage breakdowns of what the, what the kernels being called are yeah. to sort of uh, you know inform yourself, make educated guesses about mm -hmm. what's you know, dragging down performance. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So it sounds like it's a great tool for you to monitor the performance and then help you form some hypothesis. And then you can yeah. like dive deep into that and then um, it tell you specifically which part you might look into that and then you can uh, run your tests. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you'll use an insight to get maybe a you know, an exa uh, an idea of what's wrong mm -hmm. and then you'll use some functional test to determine, oh, is it in fact this this thing that I think of? So, for example, if your CPU collator is really slow, mm -hmm. an example would be like just replacing the collator with something trivia, trivial. Trivial. Yeah. That is, and and it let's say that CPU block doesn't go away. You can say, mm -hmm. oh yeah, it's it's not a collator issue. It's it's something else. Yeah. But if you know moving it to a trivial collator just fixes everything, you're set. You can say, oh yeah, like my collator is the is the bottleneck for model training. Mm -hmm. We need to improve it. Yeah. Um. So it's a little bit trial and error, mm -hmm. but uh, you sort of using Insight and using these NVIDIA tools to profile your models sort of gives you your best educated guess as to what could be dragging down performance in your model. Yeah. And uh, can you only use that when you use NVIDIA chips? Uh, unfortunately, yes. You can <laughs> only use it when we when you use NVIDIA uh -huh. chips. Um, I actually don't know if there's, there's any... Uh, I mean, there probably is an option for CPU, but I don't know yeah. if there's any option for uh, other accelerators like TPUs. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, if you're running on GPU, yeah, you can use these tools to profile your model. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that a lot, of, most people are probably using yeah. GPUs to yeah. train. So that's probably where you can uh, improve your model if you're mm -hmm. working on GPU. Yeah, um, sounds great. So... As you previously mentioned you worked on a uh, graph neural network a lot. Mm -hmm. Can you share more about how is um, uh, GNN's training different from other like tabular data model, for example, compared to XGBoost or um, time series? Yeah, yeah. So GNN's are a class of deep learning model mm -hmm. that focus on graph data. And graphs as a computational structure are kind yeah. of different than tabular data, right? Um, tabular data usually any a given row is is bounded in size. Mm -hmm. And if you're training purely tabularly, like you're just iterating through rows and using XGBoost to predict some label on that row, yeah. um, you sort of know what the shape of the row is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and for graphs, there, there are a couple of problems, actually. Um, one of them is that, uh, let's, let's say you are working on a social graph mm -hmm. of all the people in the US. That's 300 million nodes uh, and... You know, let's say each person has on on average, uh, you know, let's say a hundred uh, edges, which is a very low number, right? Yeah. You probably, I, we, we, you, you have like, like what a hundred thousand LinkedIn connections or, so, or followers <laughs> or something. Um, 
when you're at that magnitude, that graph can't be stored in, yeah. it can't even be stored on a single machine sometimes. Mm -hmm. It can't be stored in memory. Uh, so you have to figure out novel ways to decrease the graph size or to make the, uh, I guess, the local size of the problem you're trying to solve a lot smaller mm -hmm. uh, via sampling or other techniques in order to allow your computational accelerator, whether it be GP or CP or whatever yeah. you're using, to process the data. Um, so that's one of the large problems. It's figuring out how to like make a huge problem into a bunch of different small mm. problems. And there are another, uh, another set of problems to do to deal with that scale, right? Like, how do you even store it? Like, do you partition the graph across a bunch of different machines, right. whatnot? But generally, like, figuring out how to deal with the scale of graphs is generally a large problem. Mm -hmm. And as one last note, I should note that there are another class of GNNs that just take small graphs as input, like mm -hmm. SE3 Transformer, which is a drug discovery model. Yeah. I guess when I'm talking about sampling in this context, it's usually with the, the larger graphs, mm -hmm. like uh, transaction graphs, social graphs that just will not fit on one machine. Yeah. Um, so that's very interesting. So when I think about the, uh, you know, very large graph, I try to compare that to like tree based models. Are there any kind of similar to like pr pruning techniques in graphs? Yeah. I mean, so, so one of, one of the ways that we can handle the scale is, mm. um, sampling, right? So, uh, some of the time, a lot of the time, the problems that we're trying to solve in graph modeling involve a specific locality. Like, yeah. let's say uh, you're modeling financial transactions uh, between users. The things that matter to a financial transaction between, like, let's say you or me, mm -hmm. are generally the, the people that we've previously completed financial tra transactions with, yeah. right? It's our locality. It's like what is near us in the graph. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the approaches that you can do to decrease the scale of these graph problems is to sample the, your, your graph. So you'll do stuff like, um, let's say right, well, the us example, you'll take us as seed nodes in, in the network, and then you'll sample up to four hops out. You'll sample, okay, the, this person had a transaction with Kyle, and then that person had a transaction with another person, that person mm -hmm. had a transaction with another person. And that'll, that'll be included in the subgraph that we're using to train our model. Yeah. So that's generally the way that a, a lot of contemporary graph models work. There, there are a couple of other approaches, like mm -hmm. instead of sampling everything or sampling with some probability, you can do stuff like generating random walks. Oh, you'll just okay. take a, a random walk through the graph mm -hmm. and uh, that will be the sampled subgraph that, that you'll use. Mm -hmm. But generally, um, you know, you'll do something called like multi-neighbor layer sampling, which is what I described, where, which is where you'll, you'll sample the people that at one hop, two hop, three hops away mm -hmm. from the seed notes that you're trying to yeah. target. Okay. So I'm not very familiar with the graph, so I'm just going to ask some questions based on my like intuition. Yeah. Um, I think the sampling you mentioned, I think is important because it, again, comparing to tree based models, it's, uh, if you just have a single tree, it's very prone to overfitting. Um, and with the, the sampling, I think that can maybe reduce some overfitting in graph modeling. Um, so my question is because I just feel like graph relationship, is it also very easy to like overfit? Are there something kind of like ensemble when it comes to graphs? Um, so, yeah, I mean, overfitting is an interesting question with graph models mm -hmm. because we actually don't know a whole lot. They're a pretty relatively new uh, frame of research. Like yeah. some of the first benchmarking challenges, the OGB challenges just came out. The As I mentioned, the graph frameworks like DGL and uh, PyTorch Geometric are mm -hmm. relatively new. Overfitting is not... It's a little bit hard to say because it, yeah. it's, you, you have to look at a specific specific data set and model, mm -hmm. but overfitting is actually not the hugest issue, especially when you're doing sampling. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the issues that is similar to this is sort of um, data set imbalance. Like, let's say you're talking about a fraudulent transaction data yeah. set. Fraudulent transactions probably make up a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of transactions, <laughs> um, and they're yeah. also like, uh, as another note, they're they're sort of. Um, messy labels mm -hmm. they're not uh they're not perfect like you can't you can't take them as exact ground truth yeah so you have to ensure that your sampling actually uh matches a distribution that's trainable by the model mm -hmm. or because if you don't right uh the model is just going to learn you know with 99.99999 percent accuracy that it predicts that it's not fraudulent yeah. it's going to overfit to right. always just predicting that it's not fraudulent yeah um which is why you sort of have to think about biased sampling as mm -hmm. as a method to achieve or negative sampling mm -hmm. as a method to achieve more robust training uh, yeah. routine 
Uh, and in these cases, right, with fraudulent transactions, you'd much rather be a little bit over aggressive with saying it's fraud than saying it's right. Not. Yeah. Like, uh, um, based on the business case, which type of error you can tolerate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. Having your card declined is, you know, annoying, but, yeah. but having, you know, losing all your money because a fraudulent transaction went mm -hmm. through is, is, a, is, is an incredibly bad issue. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Again, like bias sampling in that case, bias sampling on the graph is a, a way to combat this sort of overfitting towards the mode class of, mm -hmm. the, of the data set. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And uh, also because of this relationship, you can find through um, the graph networks, is it easier to interpret the model compared to like other models? That's actually, that's a great question. Um, yes, it, 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 you can actually look at how... Um, uh, the uh, actually, I'm just gonna put it this way. Uh, the a lot of the graph models these days use attention as a mm -hmm. mechanism to perform, uh, I guess, operations between uh, the aggregated nodes. So, I, I guess, as a brief summary of how uh, a lot of different uh, graph neural networks work, um, they'll usually take a set of neighbor nodes to a given node and then aggregate them using some operation. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll, you'll repeat that for all the neighbors of some target node going outwards in, right? So you'll go four layers back, then three layers back, then two layers back, then one layer back yeah. to calculate these values. Um, and you can use the attention mechanism to sort of figure out or what the model is looking for in aggregation that leads it to a conclusion. Mm. Um, there's also a, a little bit of an interesting uh, tidbit with graph models there that one of the interesting things about them sort of doing this aggregation at multiple levels is if you think about it, uh, the model is actually doing something that's similar to a join. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, like let's say let's say you wanted to uh, look at some attribute in, in an attribute model of a relationship of a relationship of a relationship. <laughs> yeah. Someone someone three steps away from you, which yeah. could have impact on your social network or mm -hmm. could have impact on the transaction graph. Um, if you were doing that in, you know. But let's say at SQL, right? Like mm -hmm. if you wanted to include that in your actually boost model, you have to do three joins. Um, yeah. Whereas with the graph model, all the model has to do is traverse the graph to gather that data. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's actually not as big of a you know computational deal to do this sort of relationship join, and the, yeah. and the model actually learns the optimal join mm -hmm. in this case to uh, combine that data, which is really incredible to me. And one of the reasons I love working on graph models. Yeah. And uh, so also um, come back to the point about um, interpretation. So mm -hmm. once you visualize the relationship, it's easier for you to see, for example, using the fraud detection, you can see um, how those fraud, um, fraud fraudsters are like connected to each other. Or so it's easier also for you to like take actions once you find out the relationship. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Since, since, you're essentially always, so since you're aggregating outwards in, you can sort of see where activations may light up mm -hmm. or they may provide, uh, you know, I guess high salience towards your, your, your model output. Yeah. Um, and one of the other things you can do actually is since you're essentially generating fixed representations for every node given their locality, mm -hmm. what you can do in terms of visualization and uh, is you can use uh, like essentially approaches like K nearest neighbors or clustering yeah. to say, oh, given these representations, do they look like they're close to this fraudulent cluster mm -hmm. that we've labeled? Yeah. Which is a really powerful approach because in cases where you have really messy labels, you don't want to uh, just index the labels. You'd rather see, be able to see in terms of the, uh, you know, inner space of the model, mm -hmm. what is what is going on? What's close to what? Because you may see, oh yeah, wait, this 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 one that we say isn't fraud is awfully close to this frog, yeah. uh, frog cluster. Um, we should investigate that. Um, that that provides an interesting benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing on, on that note is that um, one thing about the labels of graph models that you can do that's interesting is you can actually train them unsupervised. Mm. Um, you, meaning that uh, the model essentially is not training on the label of fraud or not. It's mm -hmm. training on uh, a task where it predicts whether or not an edge exists. 
And using the representations trained on that task, yeah. you can actually use them for downstream tasks like XGBoost or uh, you know clustering or oh, any other okay. uh, any other method. Yeah. Uh, so you can turn like a really hard messy label problem into mm -hmm. like a bounded problem uh, using these node representations. Right, and then you can use a, a different model as a, another layer to uh, you know process the data output from the uh, graph model. That's really cool. Um, and also you mentioned, I think it's a great idea to do, you know, unsupervised learning on that because I imagine there are some relationships are fixed, like my relationship with my parents, but in terms of fraud or some other like social network, the data constantly changing. So if you put a model in um, production, how do you handle those like changes or like data drifts? That's, well, First of all, doing doing graph inference on the changing graph is still an open research subject, right? Mm -hmm. You have uh, interesting graph databases like Neo4j. You have, uh, you know, how do you represent a large changing graph <laughs> yeah. in memory? How do you, uh, even for inference, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with fraud, you want to keep it up to date, right? Uh, fraud, in some cases, you know, uh, from, from the academic literature, it seems that fraudulent cases in these transaction graphs mm -hmm. are usually very quick. They happen, you know, moments after each other. Yeah. Um, so you need to be updating the graph in real time. And that's that's actually, you know, not a fully solved problem. Right. Uh, I'd love to see it, right? That would be mm -hmm. amazing and a huge step forward for it, but it's it's still unsolved. There, there are numerous talks out there by people that, uh, you know, work on these graph problems. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some great ones from LinkedIn and uh, Pinterest about how they work with these uh, hyperscale graphs, mm -hmm. um, but it's not something that's generally solved. So uh, doing inference on these graphs is not, uh, it's not a fully solved problem that I can I can speak to. Right yeah, now. I can see that because each network, even just for social media, a social network like a, a LinkedIn or a, what is the other one, a Pinterest, I can see they their network can be completely different, right? Yeah, day day to day, you know, the stuff you interact with, yeah. the, the people you interact with, can can change very mm -hmm. rapidly. Um, so, so it's really probably like case by case. For this case, cross industry, cross platform the data drifting problem can be, you know, completely different. Yeah. And it also depends on how these companies store their graphs, right? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's a very large relational table. Different companies are going to store it differently. Yeah. Um, so I guess right now it's more of a bespoke approach where each company figures out how it works for them. And mm -hmm. I would encourage everyone who's interested in this to read uh, the papers from uh, companies that are very public about their graph work. Uh, so yeah, faith, uh, not Facebook, uh, uh, Pinterest, LinkedIn have Pinterest. released a lot of work in the graph space mm -hmm. um, that, you know, do talk about how they handle the challenges of scale yeah. and rapidly changing scale. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, okay. Now, um, I know you also worked on temporal fusion transformers for uh, PyTorch. Um, can you talk a little about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, temporal fusion transformers is this, um, well, it's a time series model. Let's, let's say that first. Yeah. Uh, it's a time series model that incorporates attention and also a traditional recurrent encoder decoder mm -hmm. framework in order to predict a multi-horizon forecast. So by that, I mean a forecast that extends just beyond the next time step. So you'd say, oh yeah, I want the next 25 time steps and it makes that prediction. Mm -hmm. I don't have the, I don't have the visualization right in front of me. So describing it is a little bit diff difficult, yeah, yeah. but the model does a couple of really cool things that you know, uh, I think are, are worth mentioning. Um, one of the first things is that the model, um, at, at its input, it does something called uh, input selection. Uh, it essentially uses, or actually it calls it, in the paper, it's called the variable selection network, which is a network that takes the state at the very start of the model mm -hmm. and uh, some static input, that being some information about the time series itself, and uses that to gate its input. So it, it basically, this you know, variable selection model at the very start actually chooses which features of the time series to uh, include or, or to, to boost in terms of magnitude in the time series. And that actually gives us a large ma manner of uh, interpretability, right? We can, lit we can look at the activations and the mask that this network is generating, and we can see oh, when we're working with this, uh, you know, a trajectory. So a trajectory is like uh, something that's associated with a unique ID. That would be like uh, a store product combo, uh, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, it's this product in this store. How, okay. here's, how it's sale, here's how it's selling in retail forecasting. You'd say, oh, in this trajectory that we've trained on, 
the activations for the the variable selection network say that you know this feature, this feature, this fe- these feature are really important, but it's mm-hmm. assigning a weight of zero to the other features. Maybe mm-hmm. we can you know affect our pre-processing to imp- you know either eliminate that or figure out a different set of features that are going to be more effective oh, and, okay. and, and uh, used by the uh, variable selection network. Yeah. Um, and then it does something really interesting later on as well. It, it actually allows for attention or it allows for interpretability across the temporal axis. Yeah. So there's sort of, in time series, there's sort of two axes that you have to sort of reduce on. Mm-hmm. It's the feature axis, right? You have a multivariate time series. You have some set of categorical and continuous values that occur at every time step. Yeah. And you also have the temporal aspect, right? Mm-hmm. You need to you need to sort of agglomerate and, um, and reduce along that axis as well. So uh, TFT uh, uses attention to reduce along the temporal axis, which means that you can actually interpret temporally which you know, elements or what time steps are informing your current time step and mm. what time steps are infor- informing this part of the horizon, um, which is really useful. So you can actually interpret across both axes very easily with this model, which yeah. is, I, I think is amazing. Yeah, because it does sound like a complex model, um, but then it provides this uh, um, uh, capability to help you with a variable selection. Yeah, yeah. Being able to... S- have a model provide sort of its its salience, which mm-hmm. is like how how important features are to you directly, is just incredibly useful when you're doing like man pre processing, right? When you're working yeah. on your data pipeline, you can say, oh yeah, well we don't actually have to include this feature because the model is just not using it, mm-hmm. or oh this feature is really important. Maybe we can include this other feature that we have in our feature store that is you know similar to it or is related to it. Um, so. I think that's just fantastic. Yeah. So how is the weight calculated? How does the model decide uh, what features are important? Yeah. So it takes the 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 input features, right? Mm-hmm. As well as the static state, which would be like information that's the same across the entire trajectory. So that would be like maybe it's unique ID. Mm. Uh, maybe it's like categorical features like... Um, what state it's in, right? The, yeah. st- the state of a time, the state of a time series is never going to change, in, right. at least in the retail case. So you, you know, you have the. When I say state, I mean like literal geographical state, mm-hmm. just to clarify. Oh, okay. So you have these these static categorical inputs, and you also have your model's inputs, and you mm-hmm. have some trained set of weights that uh, essentially combine those to form a mask for the feature set. Um, and with that mask, you just directly do an element wise multiply across that you know, mm-hmm. uh, across the, the feature dimension. Um, and that will boost or push down uh, different features. Mm-hmm. Is it related to any, uh, if it does like a, a matrix, some uh, computation that look, look at anything similar to, I don't know, correlation or um, some other feature space reduction techniques? Um, it doesn't really, so the feature space reduction comes a little bit later in the model, mm-hmm. but, uh, what it does do is it will, I believe, in the original implementation, if I remember correctly, mm-hmm. they have a gated layer that's creating the mask. Um, so they'll do uh, essentially a, I think it's, I think it's fully connected. I, I don't yeah. remember exactly. I, it's been a long time since we worked directly on the implementation. Um, I think it does a fully connected, you know, op, and then uses that as the mask. Um, but yeah, the, the the feature you know space decreases mm-hmm. uh, usually happen later in the model inside the encoder decoder framework, okay. where they generate like a more bounded smaller mm-hmm. state that's passed yeah. to the the uh, transformer at the top. Got it. Um, I see. So how does this model compare to the performance of uh, say other uh, commonly used uh, procedure like Arima or just use LSTM? That's a great question. Uh, so. Uh, TFT, in our, in my experience, and this mm-hmm. is just purely anecdotal, um, performs extremely well on the uh, data sets that we give it. We, so we took we took the data sets from the paper, the the temporal fusion transformers paper by Google mm-hmm. is uh, freely available on the internet. It's on archive. They do a demonstration where it beats out Arima and a number of other statistical techniques in uh, a couple of data sets. I think it's four. Yeah. Um, they, they use four data sets. And we've we've proven that, you know, individually, right? Part of my job is to reproduce results. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've proven that individually. And in and in addition to that, uh, we've also taken a look at like more contemporary models like XGBoost, right? We yeah. looked at XGBoost and Arima 
And a lot of the time, or, you know, almost most of the time in the data sets that I'm working with, uh, XGBoost is pretty handily beaten by TFT. Um, mm. And Arima is even more handily beaten by TFT. <laughs> so uh, it performs really well against these statistical techniques. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we're always trying to consume more data sets to see yeah. if there are other beats or if, you know, if somehow some other model that we have in our in our catalog, mm -hmm. right, we have some internal uh, time series models that we're also testing against, um, if they are, you know, beat TFT and Arima and actually based on something else, there may be some killer application for a yeah. specific model. So uh, TFT, in my experience, beats almost all statistical approaches. Okay, wow. Do you know why? That's, that's, that's a little <laughs> bit of a hard question. Yeah. Um, in my experience, one of the reasons that it beats it well, uh, so Arima makes some ex some uh, assumptions about the stationarity of the yeah, time series that right. you're trying to predict on. Mm -hmm. um, and for most data scientists, you realize very quickly that most time series are not stationary. <laughs> um, right. So there's an element there of, uh, you know, TFT's structure allowing it to better adapt to right. non-stationary distributions because mm -hmm. they can strip out trends. Mm -hmm. But with respect to XGBoost, um, you know, how, how it works. And because I know it's used in a lot of, uh, uh con contemporary time series applications. Yeah. One of the things that we found is that the, or one of the things that I found is that the multi-axis, uh, comparison, right. You, you, there's, there's sort of, if there's this concept in, um, vision called depthwise severable convolution, where you do mm -hmm. convolution across like the horizontal and then the vertical axes individually. Okay. Um, Separating, separating out these feature and time series axes mm -hmm. uh, actually does a lot to help, you know, break down each step into an internal state. Yeah. Um, whereas with XGBoost, in order to, to do it, you just need to lag all of your features yeah. uh, and then pass it as input mm -hmm. without any idea of temporal relationship to XGBoost, right? Because it's it's just a tree model. It, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't have any idea. It doesn't have any concept that the this input comes before this input comes before this input. Yeah. It's just saying, okay, I have an array of inputs. What is the best tree that I can make mm -hmm. or best set of trees I can make to achieve this label result? Yeah. Um, and it's very interesting you mentioned uh, there are some techniques used, uh, kind of borrowed from like computer vision. Um, I talked to some uh, researcher, they mentioned a long time ago, I don't know if it's still true, uh, you know, um, uh, the kind of uh, NLP people do their own research and the uh, computer vision people do their own search and then they don't kind of borrow each other's technique. But now I think more and more deep learning researchers are uh, pretty skillful in both sides. So they you borrow some computer vision technique into the, um, you know, recurrent neural work or time series related. And that has been helpful in improving the performance. Absolutely. Um, I think there's actually so much general cro cross applicability of mm. techniques between domains. Yeah. Uh, so a couple of good examples of this are in um, speech recognition, ASR. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that you do to work on ASR models, one of the contemporary techniques um, is actually this vision technique. This depthwise separable convolution yeah. is key to, you know, working on MEL spectrograms mm -hmm. in order to, you know, parse the words coming out of the, the coming into the model. Sorry. Yeah. For us, you know, in time series, we're saying, oh yeah, we can apply transformers here yeah. in graphs. We can also apply transformers in a uh, CV. There was a great paper from Google that's mm -hmm. like two weeks ago, I think uh, about uh, vision transformers. Uh, we're starting to see all these concepts blended together yeah. and a lot more um, you'll, you'll start to see there are some, very domain specific like tricks at the beginning and end that mm -hmm. you can do for certain domains. But a lot of the concepts are just so cross applicable. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, because I think nowadays when people are uh, learning machine learning or deep learning, they're exposed to different type of models. And even if you are only interested in one domain, it doesn't hurt to just read some papers in other domain and get inspired. Or some people maybe get inspired by like music or some some arts. Yeah, yeah. no, that's that's totally true. <laughs> I, I so for what it's worth, yeah. I I love reading papers from other domains. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll have to go down the rabbit hole and say, oh yeah, this paper references this paper references this yeah. paper references this paper, none of which I'm read and I'm assuming are probably landmark papers for that domain. <laughs> but um, I find that, you know, reading other domains papers actually allows you a lot of ability to sort of 
think about architectural choices mm-hmm. in a way that goes cross domain. It's just like, yeah. oh, what is the data and how does this architecture, you know, sort of interact with this format of data? Mm-hmm. Um, which I think is a better way than segmenting yourself and saying, uh, you know, oh, NLP, I'm only using transformers. Yeah. Um, you know, m- maybe there's some co- CV technique that's going to be useful in transformers soon yeah. or, or some other thing. And we're just not discovering it because we're not thinking about, you know, what is the data that we're actually consuming? Right. Um, and how does that relate to the structures that we know can we can be used in other domains? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. And, uh, previously you mentioned, um, TFT uh, is better compared to um, ARIMA and uh, um, other you know, SG Boost. So I'm curious, how does it, have you co- do the comparison to, I think Facebook have the profit model. They take care of seasonality and they have the, you know, the holiday uh, feature. Have you yeah. compared that? So uh, one of the things about profit that's interesting mm. is that um, it's sort of, Built to be an analyst tool. Yeah. Um, profit is really strong, and and maybe I shouldn't say really strong because you know it's there's beats for it and or stuff other stuff beats it in, in a lot yeah. of cases. But profit's strong uh, when you allow an analyst that doesn't necessarily have like a ton of technical experience okay. to plug yeah. in features. Right. They mm-hmm. can say, oh, I think this holiday feature is important. Right? right. You can sort of plug in human mm-hmm. intuition into this model. Yeah. Whereas, um, you know. TFT, all that intuition, like you can feed it features, right? Mm-hmm. But you're not telling the model itself, oh, this is a seasonality feature. Right. This is, you know, like, oh, this is, you know, the date or this mm-hmm. is how many days it is till Christmas. And, mm-hmm. and therefore it has this, uh, you know, this seasonality or this this attribute of cycle. So it's very good when you allow analysts to encode human intuition. Yeah. But when you're just taking in features, right? Mm-hmm. When you may not know what the impact of, Features are, you know, when right. you're doing other stuff. TFT is is going to beat almost all the time. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, even in those cases when you can encode human intuition, mm-hmm. TFT still wins sometimes or yeah. a lot of the time. Oh, okay. Uh, but as I was saying, yeah, Prof- Profit is really good analyst tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as like a heavyweight model goes, it's not, you know, it's 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 not sort of built for the same thing that TFT is. Got it. Yeah, it's kind of like if you don't know how to use Photoshop, you can use the Instagram filter that can. Um, help you with your goals. And then <laughs> if you want to do deeper analysis, you have more um, understanding in like deep learning um, using TFT can better. Uh, and also it's easier maybe for you to customize your model. Um, yeah, you can yeah. change embedding shapes and sizes. Mm-hmm. You can change, you know, there are any number of hyperparameters that you can yeah. change and you can choose to feed it different features and whatnot. Um, but I like to think about all data science tools as sort of like a hierarchy of how easy is this to use, Yeah. right? Oh, this is easier than this, is easier than this, and mm-hmm. easier than this. And it's just sort of about building up your experience until you you hit that point. So for a lot of use cases, you know, profit is great. It's good at generating seasonal reports. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in cases where you're going to try and milk accuracy out of mm-hmm. your model, you, like having, uh, you know, something that, like like profit versus TFT where you're actually losing on accuracy by using profit when uh, if you lose even a 1% accuracy on forecasting, like let's say produce demand, you're you're, li- you're literally losing 1% of your revenue. Yeah. Um, which for large companies is a massive amount. That TFT is is the, and models like it are, are mm-hmm. by far the, the better used approach. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, can you tell us a little more about how TFT handles uh, seasonality or do you have to tell the model, um, use your own like seasonality as a feature? You don't specify that. So seasonality like features are sort of, um, how should I put this? They, they occupy an interesting temporal space. Yeah. Um, they, they occupy a space that I would call their known uh continuous values usually, Mm -hmm. um, meaning that they're known into the future, right? Like what day of the week it is, is going to be known forever. Right. Um, but they have important impact on the model. So Mm -hmm. you can feed those features in vanilla and, uh, that the model tends to learn the seasonality involved Mm -hmm. there. If you really, really wanted to, you know, include some sort of seasonality, what some, what I've seen some papers do that I is, is not employed in TFT mm-hmm. is they'll actually embed a seasonality signal in as like one of the inputs. So like yeah. they'll say, 
oh, this happens every eight days. Let's put a sine wave that has a frequency of eight mm -hmm. on in, w within our input data. Mm. Um, and I, I believe Informer, uh, which is another time series paper, did that. Um, and that's an interesting approach because, you know, you may actually having the signal along the, along the, the line may actually mm -hmm. provide you with stuff, but also having, also having this indicator that, oh, it is Thursday, to, Thursday today is used by the model. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's an, it's an input to the model. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And, uh, um, you also worked on like, recommender systems. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, recommender systems are a really interesting space. NVIDIA is right now doing a, an enormous amount of very interesting work on mm -hmm. recommender systems. There's a project called Merlin, uh, which, you know, publicly known about, you can search it online, um, that aims to accelerate every aspect of recommender systems. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I was, I've done at my time in NVIDIA is work with the Merlin team to ensure that our pre-processing and data, lo data loading pipelines mm -hmm. for contemporary you know, recommender system models like wide and deep or deep learning mm -hmm. recommendation model DLRM. Yeah. Um, ensuring that they, you know, sort of work or are at the speed of light with these specialized data loaders that are built sort of for Rexis specifically. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what Merlin does. So I've, I've sort of worked with that team and I've worked on a couple of different recommender systems models on, um, mostly, uh, you know, quick prediction tasks. Um, uh, but, uh, the interesting part of that work was moving largely CPU bound pre-processing operations mm -hmm. to GPU. Um, I actually didn't know prior to working on this project that, yeah. that there even were GPU accelerated pre-processing operations. Mm -hmm. Um, but we have a library called QDF, which is just GPU accelerated pandas, um, or is very, very close to GPU accelerated mm -hmm. pandas. Um, and uh, the Merlin library and Vtabular, which are custom designed for working on recommender system applications. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's this, there's this, a blog post I wrote a while ago yeah. about how we were able to accelerate this 43 hour long workflow into a 10 minute long workflow oh, wow. by moving a lot of the pre-processing onto GPU mm -hmm. and using, uh, you know, using the GPU to its max capability across the entire data science workflow mm -hmm. and not just, you know, training deep learning. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, pretty impressive. So besides moving from the CPU to GPU, what are some other things you can do uh, to improve the efficiency of pre-processing? That's a great question. Um, you know, I'm not as experienced as some of the senior data scientists you probably had on, but um, one of the, a couple of the key things that you can do are, you know, first of all, uh, you want to ensure that the order in which the order and way in which you're doing joins mm -hmm. um, reduces the total table size. Like early, like well, let, let's say you can, you have like four four joins that you can do in a differentiable mm -hmm. order. Yeah. If if one of the joins is going to expand the the table by a factor of three, mm -hmm. and one of the joins is going to expand the fate table by a factor of one point five, because you know, like let's say they're like duplicate keys. Yeah. Um, you're going to want to push up. Uh, the less expensive operations. And by the way, when you're doing this purely in SQL, uh, the SQL engine actually does this for you, right? Yeah. It, it figures out what the most efficient way to do mm -hmm. these joins is. But when you're working in like, let's say PySpark or uh, another uh, pre-processing framework, mm -hmm. right? You do actually have to be mindful of the fact that, oh, saying that I do this here is going to greatly increase the size of my uh, table. And any further ops that I do on this table are going to be on that greater size table. Yeah. So maybe I want to use these, you know, these ops that don't increase the the table size first mm -hmm. and then use this other op. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the ways that I've, I sort of accelerated that yeah. workflow. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And going back to recommender system. So as a user of recommender <laughs> system, I find that uh, sometimes it gets very sensitive, right? If I... Um, maybe picked a gift for my friend and then all of a sudden I get recommended for that gift. But I do understand people change, right? You want to adapt. But I, I, I don't know if that's the overfitting problem or the model gets too like sensitive. So when you build an application, um, how do you make sure the model keeps learning but also don't get too sensitive? 
Yeah, so this is this is an open body of research, and not one that, by the way, not one that I'm directly <laughs> working in. So I, it may not be yeah. uh, completely applicable what I'm saying. Uh-huh. Um, but there are a couple of approaches, right? There is an interesting uh, paper by uh, a team. I think it was the Coveo team mm-hmm. um, called Reckless, which is a series of evaluation metrics for recommender system platforms, mm-hmm. um, and what they focus on is the fact that like let's the, what there are let's say you know maybe 10 metrics that you could use uh, that are or commonly used to yeah. train recommender systems mm-hmm. and evaluate them and what these don't account for is like the user experience maybe, maybe they are really good at predicting the click most of the time yeah but they can also generate terrible experiences where if you buy a couch you're going to be recommended a couch like 90 times right so what this reckless paper tries to do is um, in some cases it tries to take a sequential approach and say you know sequentially like are these recommendations that I'm making after this string mm. good? Um, and are we actually generating unique items that, you know, they haven't interacted with? Um, and more like to, to, to take an RL uh, reinforcement learning term, yeah. uh, you know, exploration versus exploitation, yeah. right? Like the model is going to try to exploit what it's learned. And mm-hmm. as you mentioned, overfit and, and use this, you know, what it knows you like a lot of, a lot of different times. Yeah. Um, whereas you may want the model to be more explorative and mm-hmm. actually propose things that are, let's say, you know, you'd be unlikely, maybe not unlikely to click, but um, uh, aren't related to your immediate history. Right. Yeah. Like, let's say, you know, it knows that I'm into, I, I bought a camera and maybe, you know, the next set of recommendations mm-hmm. are going to be lenses yeah. um, and not, a hundred different other cameras mm-hmm. because that that's just not useful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great approach. And I think a recommender system is one of the machine learning models that you have to look at how customers interact, you know, not just from the performance, like accuracy, you need to look at whether people actually using the widget. If people don't click, uh, maybe it's not an issue with the model. Maybe it's the design of the website or it could be something with the model, right? Yeah, that's a that's a really big challenge, right? Yeah. Because y- there's no way of you collecting, right? Like recommender systems sort of rely on explicit data. Like, yeah. did, oh, did they click this ad? Oh, mm-hmm. did they click this item? Did this? Did they click this item? Um, but there could be any number of unseen variables like, right. oh, maybe, um, you know, uh, what is an example? maybe the UI wasn't working. Maybe mm. the page took too long to load. And, you know, of course, there are data science teams that like incorporate all this data. But uh, you really do have to take a more holistic approach to yeah. how you treat recommenders. Um, and on a, another note, sort of going <laughs> going full circle back to graphs. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the interesting parts about these graph models for Rexis mm-hmm. is that um, you're treating both like people and items as nodes. Okay. And part of the, the the recommender system, you know, a lot of recommender system architectures are about trying to figure out like, um, it's basically it's like a matrix factorization mm-hmm. task where you're trying to like, basically there's this user item matrix that represents like how a user would interact yeah. with every item. And you're trying to approximate like how any user, like the, the column for that user. Mm-hmm. Um, and the common way to do this is uh, called matrix factorization or yeah. collaborative filtering approaches. Mm-hmm. When you go into sort of graph models, you're actually, in, first of all, they incorporate a lot of sequence data. So you yeah. can use sequence-based metrics. You can say, take the 10 most recent edges and, mm-hmm. and sort of look at if, uh, use some contrastive metric against the, the node representations on those edges and say, Okay, like let's penalize you for recommending the same thing four times that they've previously <laughs> yeah, interacted with. Right. You can introduce really with these graph systems where you, you know, where everything's represented mm-hmm. as a series of directed temporal edges, mm-hmm. you can sort of look at those edges and you can you can generate metrics that actually match user experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, you could generate adverse effects, right? You, yeah. you could generate some weird effects. So it's 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 this balancing act. Um, but I, I really do think that there is benefit in taking this graph-based approach for Rexis. Um, not that, you know, I'm not, I'm not currently working on Rexis, graphs for Rexis, but yeah. um, I think that one of the interesting research directions for Rexis is using these graphs because they not only provide the data about sequence, right? The mm-hmm. time steps that yeah. each thing is on, but they also provide information about like users four steps away. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you interacted with this item 
And then here's a similar user and they also interact with yeah. a different item, but there's a user over here. So if you do four step sampling, you capture that. Yeah. And you can get a lot more interesting results than if you'd just done the uh, only user centric approach mm -hmm. of like matrix factorization because you're also incorporating information about very similar users by how they interact on the graph itself. Yeah. Uh, it does seem like a uh, you know, graph model would be a great solution for uh, recommender systems. And I previously saw some comments around uh, recommender um, system. And some people say, oh, you know, a lot of, we tried some deep learning approach, but what works at the end of the day is just the matrix uh, factorization. Yeah. I think that's still a lot of uh, company uh, uses. So from a research perspective, um, what do you think about, you know, deep learning, more complicated model versus matrix factorization? Do you feel it's still, you know, it's useful, it can still stay there for a while, or you think there are going to be a lot of innovation, for example, graph models that are going to take over, have huge impact? I think it really depends on metrics that are outside of model training, right? Mm. Like, if your search engine has churn, and your churn is directly related to how, you know, the quality of search items that you're Yeah. Running, right? A lot of times, if, you're, if your churn is low and you're using a collaborative filtering approach, there's no reason for you to change it, right? Like mm. if, if CF, or, or which is matrix factorization, or, or like NCF, which is the neural variant that still focuses on matrix factorization, if those approaches work, there's no reason to change them. Yeah. And actually, in the words, in the words of, you know, in the discussion I had like a couple weeks ago, there's discussions like uh, I was talking to a friend and he said, you know, um, I'm he's a product manager and he said, I'm I'm currently working on a data product mm -hmm. and we're we're you know we're working on a recommender system for our platform. Yeah. And I was like talking to him like, oh, here's all this you know interesting research about this and that. And he's like, well, for now, our users are completely fine using a matrix factorization <laughs> yeah. approach. So I don't need any of that, yeah. you know, maybe when our use, user recommendation case is a lot more complex, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in the case of like Amazon or Facebook or, you know, those type level of companies, mm. um, maybe it, it, it does make more sense from a user metric standpoint to yeah. adopt these approaches. And of course, there's the question of how do you actually incorporate and test yeah. these like A-B testing right. or, or, or doing multi-arm mm. bandit testing with models. So that's, that's an entire body of research itself. It's like mm. figuring out if you should move from one model to the next in production. Um, but the, in the end, right, um, it's all about those user-centric metrics, yeah. right? Like it's, are users working with your platform? Are they stay, are they, are mm -hmm. they sticky? Are they sticking with your platform? Are they, you know, um, in, in aggregate, did implementing this new model actually improve user retention? Yeah. Um, and I think that, for in some cases, in, in cases in which recommendation is very nuanced, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, for example, if rec the recommendation system was better when you bought something, yeah. and instead of getting, you know, eighty other things that are exactly the same, you got mm -hmm. maybe, you know, let's say you bought a couch, and yeah. it started recommending chaise pillows to you immediately uh -huh. after. There's a high chance that you're probably going to interact with that, right? Because right. you need new pillows for your couch. Mm -hmm. um, and that may require a slightly more complex model because, you know, modeling that behavior is complex. If you're doing something that's very, you know, sort of basic, trying to figure out like user item predictions mm -hmm. um, and, and there's no like idea about sequentiality and there's, yeah. there's nothing bad about predicting the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. Like DoorDash just figured out that I order this one thing all the time. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think there's a really a problem with that, yeah. right? Like you don't need to implement the state of the art model to right. do that. So it really depends on the complexity of the application and how nuanced you need your model to be. Right. Because a lot of the times these matrix factorization approaches, mm -hmm. they may they tend to, you know, they they tend to have that problem of doing like similar recommendation because that's what they're doing. Yeah. They're trying to figure out, you know, you're similar to, you know, on on this matrix, you know, you're similar to this other user and this is, you know, in in the in the factorization of the matrix, it's you're mm -hmm. basically represented as a vector. And, you know, this vector is similar to these eight other users. And that means that you get this item on, on recommendation, which is fine. Yeah. Um, but if you need something more nuanced, you probably need something more complex. Yeah. Uh, speaking of nuanced experience, I want to share a funny <laughs> experience with recommendation engine uh, system. So it was one time, I think I was searching for like a white dress. 
And okay. after that, um, the website started to recommend like a wedding dress yeah. <laughs> for me yeah. and an uh, engagement ring. Oh I my. thought it was funny because I probably wouldn't be the person buying both an engagement ring and a wedding dress, although they're related in yeah. a way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are so many instances in where recommender systems are like, close to correct. They right. understand the yeah. correct genre or context, mm -hmm. but they don't understand the nuance of the sequence of recommendations, yeah. right? Oh, if you're buying a white dress and you're buying, not buying a wedding dress, you're not mm -hmm. looking at the explicit term <laughs> right, wedding dress, you're probably not looking for a wedding dress, right? Right. That's like a very common sense thing for humans. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking, you know, when you're, when you're on a model that's just trying to figure out, you know, oh, this, this purchase that they made is like this purchase or, you know, this purchase, this person's, you know, column in the in the factorized matrix looks like this, uh, right? Like it, it doesn't understand that nuance at all. There's no way to understand yeah. it. Um, which is why I sort of think that in terms of the future of stuff, I think that these sequential and graph-based approaches mm -hmm. are going to become a lot more interesting because um, in the graph-based case, right, it sees you interacting with white dress and it doesn't see you interacting, you know, like it doesn't see you interacting with these other things that are akin to marriage. It's probably yeah. like, oh, I'm just looking for a white dress, not, you know, getting <laughs> right. married. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that there is some benefit there. Yeah. Um, in, in going more complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I wonder whether there are some cases where there's a, like ethics around uh, the things you recommend. Has there been, I'm sure there might be some biases, but it's because you recommend from like a pool of things. It's also hard to moderate. So how do um, scientists solve this problem? Content moderation? Uh, that actually, unfortunately, I don't, I don't know yeah. enough about content moderation to, to speak to that. If I had to guess, uh, you could use some embedding ab uh, 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 based approaches to mm -hmm. content to figure out abusive content. In fact, there are some graph based approaches to do that. Okay. Identifying patterns of abusive user behavior is hard, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. abusive behavior changes over. There's like severe drift over time as they realize how to circumvent the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Facebook has been pay, playing cat and mouse with respect to like bots on their platform for mm -hmm. years and years and years and years and yeah. years. And the, you know they, they're doing a good job so far, but they, you know, they have to continuously play the game. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't, I don't know enough about the the stay there at research to, yeah. to speak to that. Yeah, um, I th thank you for sharing that. I think what I was thinking was something more specific. For example, uh, if I bought some elect, like, I don't know, I bought TV, I bought laptop, those things are kind of more expensive. And uh, for someone else, may maybe they, they bought something, some item that just like cheaper. Uh, is it possible that the algorithm... So for us, we're both searching a t-shirt, but they learn some behavior. They think, oh, maybe they recommend a more expensive t-shirt for me, but recommend a cheaper t-shirt for you. Like for th those cases, are there concerns about, you know, like ethics or some moderation for a recommendation? System? That's absolutely, that's a good question, right? Um, I mean, a good example would be like if, you know, if you're doing recommendations in, in healthcare, like mm -hmm. how do you how do you figure out like, you know, how do you disentangle like someone that is a hypochondriac, right? Yeah. Versus someone that isn't like a hypochondriac probably has like an extensive medical record because mm -hmm. they've they've gone in right. a lot. And, you know, does that mean that they're gonna be somehow recommended to like a different level of care because they're hypochondriac? That's a hard question because recommender systems, right? They just they're all they're doing in essence, is trying to use the past to predict like a future best item mm -hmm. or like a probability um, yeah. without any like nuance or debiasing. And mm -hmm. I know that there there are actually uh, a number of like research directions into how to debias models. Like, yeah. uh, for example, uh, basically taking nodes that are basically taking like users that are labeled in terms of, uh, you know, their maybe they're you know, some, you know, classic attribute and trying to make it so that all else even the recommendations are the same between mm -hmm. these classes even though they have you may have slightly different behavior yeah um uh it's a very interesting you know portion of ai ethics mm -hmm. but since i'm more on the architecture side i don't really explore that space yeah that often. yeah thanks for sharing that and uh, it seems like you have a uh, you know, wide range of topics that you're interested in about machine learning research and uh, you have have been having a great career. So I wonder whether you have had any like challenges or made some mistakes in your career. Yeah. Um, 
In my deep learning career, I think that one of the most challenging things for me to sort of come to terms with mm. is this aspect of incompleteness. Um, and, and I'll go a little bit more into it, but yeah. the idea generally is that, you know, in school, right, uh, you are, or throughout most of your early life, mm. you are assigned metrics that judge your success. It's like binary, like, oh, I did this, I did that. Yeah. I, you know, I've checked this box. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas with deep learning in training and production, you sort of have like a lot more sliding metrics and a lot more, um, switches to not switches. Uh, you have a lot more different attributes to sort of make decisions on. Yeah. Um, and, and sometimes it feels really hard to sort of assess yourself mm -hmm. because, you know, oh, you're pushing for higher accuracy. You haven't gotten higher accuracy in a long time. You know, maybe it's just the model. Maybe it's yeah. just the data set. Maybe it's just X or Y or Z. It's really hard to sort of like center yourself and realize that you're making forward progress. Mm -hmm. um, like for me, one of the hardest parts when I was an intern at NVIDIA was I was working on Masker CNN mm -hmm. and I got pretty far in the first part of the internship. First four weeks, great. I did, I did amazing. I got the model set up. I, you know, the, the, the bounded task of the, the, you know, internship was to, uh, get Masker CNN working very performantly in TensorFlow 2. It was the first attempted model in TensorFlow 2, uh, for my team. Um, and you know, uh, there are a bunch of unknowns there, right? Like we, uh, there are a lot of unknowns. So I, I, you know, got everything up and working in like three weeks. And then I hit a wall um, mm. and I was like, oh, I, searching through code base to find the problem. And yeah. turns out the problem was very unrelated and, and had to do with the backbone of the model not being set correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and then my accuracy jumps. And then, okay. but it's not at the, you know, research level accuracy yeah. that yet. And I have to go another like four weeks to sort of figure out, you know, um, something, what's wrong, right? Like mm -hmm. I need to, I need to dive into the code, go very deep. Uh, make changes, see if they elicit a res result, sort of like the the scientific approach, right? Like yeah. you need to, you go in with a hypothesis, A, this is wrong, mm -hmm. and say, oh, can I prove or disprove this hypothesis? Yeah. Um, you know, does this work? And the, um, the pace of change yeah. is hard because you don't feel like you're moving consistently. Mm -hmm. It's It feels like you're, you know, you'll make a big step and then you'll be stuck for six weeks and you'll make another <laughs> big step and then you'll be stuck for six weeks. Yeah. Um, which like sort of to our human brains, right? Yeah. Doesn't feel great because we're, we as humans are biased towards, you know, getting a constant drip of serotonin and mm -hmm. constant drip of, you know, feeling accomplished. Yeah. Um, but it, it just doesn't work that way in deep learning development. Mm -hmm. Um, so you need to sort of acclimate yourself to, a environment where you're going to possibly go for long periods of time without what would be seen as like a, a pure success. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, so basically, I think the biggest difference between in school and at work is your progression isn't linear anymore. And uh, no, yeah. no, it's not. I mean, it, it, it really feels like, you know, uh, the, the change is very drastic initially. Mm -hmm. And you don't, you don't really see your peers going through the change mm -hmm. because, you know, your peers are maybe, for me, like I have some people that on my team that are PhDs, master students, yeah. I just have a bachelor's. Mm -hmm. um, you feel like, oh, maybe it's something about me. Like maybe there's something wrong with me. And then mm. after a, a while, you realize sort of, oh, when they were, you know, just getting into the swing of things, they were, they didn't have as steady progress as they do now. They were like right. me where, you know, the progress comes, but it comes in, in bursts. Yeah. Um, another thing is, right, since you're working in a team setting, you often see the successes of all your team members. Like yeah. in aggregate, it seems continuous. Right. Because you're like, oh, this person's successful and this person's successful and this person's successful mm -hmm. and this person's successful. Yeah. But you don't see that, oh, this person just spent four months to get to this point. Yeah. And, you know, that person took six months to get to this point or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, you only see the, the trail of success. Yeah. Um, but, Right, like it doesn't count for the millions of experience experiments that they've been running in the background to get to that point. Yeah, I think have the awareness that everybody's kind of going through the same thing is, is important to help you also know that you're not alone on this journey. Um, and I think you mentioned sometimes you have this hiatus uh, for you know six months or something. Um, how do you help yourself to 
I, I'm sure you probably create some small milestones for you to, I don't know, like celebrate, keep it going along the yeah. way. How do you do that? Keep that serotonin going? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, finding small wins is a, is a big thing for me. Yeah. Um, so like, it, let's say I was working on performance of a model and it's, it's mm. like a really grueling challenge because there's a lot wrong with it or, you know, maybe there's something missing. Um, finding like the small win of saying, okay, you know, like, even if I, even if the 10 experiments that I tried today didn't work, mm -hmm. even if they did absolutely nothing, yeah, um, I'm 10 steps closer to finding out, you know, what, what, how I can decrease this blocker or mm -hmm. remove this blocker. Because eventually after you exhaust all the options, you will find it a hundred percent. If there is a solution, you will find it. If you just keep being consistent and mm -hmm. applying the scientific process over and over and over and over going in with the hypothesis, testing it verifying and mm -hmm. then retrying if you don't succeed. Um, so kind of keeping track of even your failed experiments and treating them as a good thing because you've eliminated yeah. stuff feels kind of good. Mm -hmm. um, and that's at least how I treat it. Yeah. Um, I know that, uh, you know, I've, I've heard from others that, um, you know, sort of uh, similar approaches where you, you sort of think, think in terms of like, oh, like I have N, failed attempts to reach a solution, not mm -hmm. N of failed attempts, like, oh, getting a successful solution requires a thousand failed attempts. Let's just keep my counter going up. Yeah. Um, I've actually heard that has a pretty good, um, you know, success rate. And I mean, you're going to be documenting this anyways mm -hmm. in your standups and saying, hey, I tried A, B, C, and D. Um, why not just track it for yourself and say, hey, I'm, I'm getting closer to that thousand right. mistakes that lead me to a correct answer. Yeah, I think that's an important approach. I think at different stage of your project, you need to use different metrics to set goals. Um, once you're, wh while you're in a exploration or research phase, uh, maybe don't, of course you want to look at the performance, but maybe that's not like the primary metric, <laughs> but think about how many models you have tried, right? Like the boxes you checked. And also what I find useful is if I just start a new project, it's hard. I, I'm still failing, um, you know, procrastinate when it's like a new challenging project, but yeah. I'm not thinking about how I figured out. I'm just thinking, okay, today I just want to spend, you know, one hour, two hours. Think about like a time wise goal, like have I achieved that? And once I have a better sense of the project, I would actually use the result based goal. Hey, have I achieved this? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, I mean, one of the one of the best things that I've done in terms of sort of preparing my mental state for working on mm -hmm. this sort of task is I like I like sort of like to look down um, on like after reaching the peak, right? I'm going to use a mountain <laughs> analogy. Yeah. After reaching the peak of mm -hmm. you know achieving full success, pure success, mm -hmm. like let's say oh the model, the best accuracy, recording at recorded accuracy, the best performance, whatever. I, I sort of like to go back through, you know, my, my logs of the last N weeks, whatever the, ah, the length of the project. And yeah. I like to sort of like count what the worst breakpoints were. First of all, mm. you know, you sort of, you may solve them in the moment, but you yeah. tend to forget mm -hmm. um, what you did to get to a solution. Yeah. But if you sort of look back and say, hey, oh, I tried 10 things to get past this. And then mm -hmm. the 11th thing, this thing was the thing that solved it. Um, first of all, that cements that solution in your memory. Yeah. And second of all, it sort of gives you like a sense of like worthwhileness to those failed attempts. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. you're like, oh, these, I remember attempt number one and attempt number two, mm -hmm. um, like they were my first thoughts and they, it was important that I got through them. Yeah. Right. Like, because you wouldn't have gone to the answer if you hadn't, if you just stopped at three. Yeah. Um, that's so smart because I think a lot of time when we finish a project or achieve success, we just, yay, yeah, celebrate you revel it. In it. we forgot that. But I think it's very important to learn from your own journey because like you mentioned, you look at all those failures. So next time you have this failure, you can channel the experience. Hey, maybe I'm just, you know, on the way of achieving the same thing, but just because you are so deep in the current frustration, you don't see yourself there. Yeah. It's yeah. so helpful. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so besides that, what are some other things you try to like document or, or do once you finish a project? Um, I, so I like, I sort of like talking about like interesting design solutions with my, like if I, if I, if I made something that will be generally cross applicable, mm -hmm. I like to talk about it with my general team and say, Hey, this thing that I, you know, this approach that I tried, it worked, yeah. you know, you guys can use it too. Right. Um, 
doing exercises in that, like, I feel like generates a lot of like intellectual discourse about what you're working on, which yeah. is, I think like really important, especially in teams like mine. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in my post project, uh, thoughts, I also sort of like to also go back and say, like, sort of add s the probably maybe, well, let's call them the worst mistakes mm -hmm. or like the state mistakes that, um, or problems that really affected everything. I like mm -hmm. to sort of add them to like a journal that I have. Okay. Um, because it's like, oh yeah, like chances are my career in deep learning, I've actually encountered the same error a couple of times, yeah. right? Like I, I know that this means this right now. Like mm. if I get that CUDA error that says, oh yeah, source index out of, out of bounds, that probably means that my embedding table is smaller than my mm. input for some reason. Um, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, generally does help. And if there, if there are larger errors, you know, all the more reason to, to keep that log. Yeah. Um, and that helps me stay like more efficient on, you know, future projects. Right. Yeah. I think it document, um, the mistakes you made and also previously you mentioned, talk, talk to your, share your, um, learnings. I think it's not just the whole project was successful. There are successful decisions, successful elements that you can, um, recycle for the future. And, uh, um, I think it's also important to not like decouple, but kind of deconstruct the entire success into some small um, decisions and look back. So next time you, when you have something similar, um, maybe, it, you know, I'm not like every decision is different, but you know, you had a, some reference. Yeah. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, so you have, you didn't have a PhD or a master, but now you, are uh, become a machine learning researcher and uh, for people with a similar experience um how do you recommend them to uh, go into this path like how do you learn to get this level uh, that's a that's a hard question um no one's the same there are people that you know they really love their phd i have friends in their phds right mm -hmm. now um you know, they love their PhD and they're going to come out into industry and they're going to be at this level. They're going to be, they're going to do just fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but for people that sort of want to follow my path a little bit mm -hmm. more, there are a couple of things you can do. I mean, first of all, there, there's actually two indiv individual tracks, right? Yeah. There's the first one is what skills do you need? Like, what do you need to develop mm -hmm. before you can, you know, work at this level? Mm -hmm. And this, then the second thing you need to do is like, how do I get my foot in the door? Yeah. Right. So as the, as the first one, um, one of the things that I recommend and I've recommended to people that have asked mm -hmm. is I think it's important to sort of focus at least initially on like a single domain that you want to achieve mastery in. Yeah. Um, because right. Like if you attempt to like solve all the domains, like if you, if you want to say, oh, I know RNNs and transformers and all this stuff and all this stuff, mm -hmm. you know, you probably know them all. Yeah. Uh, but because you don't have any deep experience in any of them, like you probably may not be able to solve like a nuanced challenge in any mm -hmm. of them. Um, whereas like if you, let's say have really deep CV research or deep CV project experience, yeah, that probably means that you know how to solve, you know how to debug CV models quicker, mm -hmm. that yet that means that you know uh, all the tips and tricks that you've learned in your own, you know, failure journal <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, the entire way. Mm. Um, so, Go, go deep, go deep in one domain first. Yeah. The second thing is, you know, just interact with the, the people, the contemporary minds within that domain. Like, yeah. um, I, I love talking academically to people mm -hmm. like I, with graphs, I love talking to people that love graphs with yeah. Rexis. You know, I love talking to paper authors. Yeah. Um, I mean, while I'm at NVIDIA now, like I love inviting paper authors to just come and talk about their paper. Nice. Um, which, by the way, if if your team is not doing this, you know, <laughs> I would wholeheartedly recommend it. It's, yeah. it's amazing. I would say that, you know, people are generally more willing to like talk academically. Mm -hmm. If you just show interest, if you show that you put in the work to like learn a little bit about this, yeah. like people are so willing to engage with you, talk about their research, and mm -hmm. you you learn more by osmosis. Yeah. Um. So that's in terms of the knowledge gap. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. In terms of the like getting your foot in the door gap. Yeah. Uh. That's hard, right? Because everyone says, oh yeah, I need experience to get experience. Right. That's, it's a chicken and the egg problem. Mm. Um, I like to look at it now because I've been on the other side of it mm -hmm. um, from like a more, like what are the signals that I look for in, in someone, even if they don't have like work experience. Yeah. Um, so obviously work experience, like in terms of the hierarchy of like what I look for, for mm -hmm. you know, when I'm looking at a resume, right? There's 
first of all, work experience, right? Hard work experience where they talk about in depth about the project they worked on, the yeah. techniques they applied, and the you know re- like numerical results. Like if mm-hmm. they, they can say, oh, I improved NCDG by ten percent right. relatively. Yeah, that's like a lot better than saying improved internal metrics. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, the impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to establish impact. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is also in the, in these, I I really. I'm not a fan of seeing the word accuracy because uh-huh. it's incredibly <laughs> ambiguous. And it also, you know, if I, if I see, you know, like if I see someone use an interesting metric that like fits the business task or the mm. thing that they're working on, like, for example, if I see someone working in the medical domain for like cancer prediction and I see them use the term accuracy, I'm going to ask of course, like, okay, why are you using accuracy as a metric? Right. Yeah. Because y- you, you care way more about, true positives than you care about anything else, right? You, yeah. you always want to detect cancer. Well, obviously you don't want to always, de- you want to detect cancer in those that actually mm-hmm. have it. Um, and you don't care about generating false positives. Um, so like saying, oh, I achieved 99% accuracy could just be because 99% of the samples you had didn't have cancer and your model is just predicting that there's no cancer. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, in terms of resumes, I don't, I don't like to really see the word accuracy unless it's like associated with a specific metric. Yeah. And then- in terms of the other like hierarchy of, you know, things to do, mm-hmm. right? The second one be research experience. You know, if you're in college, if you, uh, you know, if you want to get into deep learning, research is a great way to do it. You know, getting published is a, a great thing. It's super fun. Yeah. Um, and also on your resume, it sort of gives an example of like the research topics and stuff that you're interested in working on. Mm-hmm. And then if you can't do that, obviously, like there are people that, you know, just just can't because of their own personal circumstances. They mm-hmm. don't have time or something. Yeah. Um, Personal projects are another good, strong signal. Honestly, like personal projects that are, I would I would put an asterisk on that and say personal projects that are like unique or related to you. Like I'd yeah. rather see like someone that does like conceptual music generation using GANs or something yeah. versus, you know, like this the same template project, mm-hmm. right? Like I want to see like you in your projects. That's, it's super cool, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I want to go into an interview and say, wow, this looks super cool. Can we talk about this? Right. Um, so uh, those are the three things I would, you know, three strong signals I would say like we, I at least really look mm-hmm. for. And of course it's going to differ by man- manager by manager and team by team. But in terms of people that want to do work similar to what I've described, working on implementing architectures, mm-hmm. if you can prove that you did performance improvement, yeah. that's, that's a huge plus for our team. Yeah. If you can prove somehow that you've done that. Mm-hmm. And sort of just demonstrating that you've experienced working in the field of deep learning are mm-hmm. just the pretty key things, right? Yeah. Like that's in the end all be all. That's what we need to see. Mm-hmm. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, speaking of a personal project, what are some personal projects you're working on? Right now, mm-hmm. I am playing around with a couple of things. Uh, recently, okay. <laughs> Uh, I, I like to dabble in Kaggle a little bit. I don't necessarily submit. I, I just like to play with the data sets yeah. um, and use sometimes zany or 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 uh, maybe more out there model approaches to mm-hmm. work on them. So there's currently an H and M Kaggle competition for uh, recommender systems about okay. uh, that involves like multimodal data. Like it mm-hmm. has a picture of the item. It has like the item you know internal metadata and yeah. a bunch of stuff and you know trying to figure out how to do, how to work on that. So I'm working on a sort of hybridized approach of graph and computer vision mm-hmm. work um, for that, which is kind of fun because, you know, the competition setting sort of gets my blood racing a little bit. Yeah. Um, in terms of other stuff, deep learning wise, I'm also doing some experiments with StyleGAN, which mm-hmm. is a, you know, a, basically a, a, just a generative adversarial model um, on uh doing stuff for like small, like pixel scale art. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, 64 by 64 pixel and stuff like full scale mm-hmm. images. There are a bunch of cool projects on that, but I'm experimenting with a, a bunch yeah. of different ones because, you know, as a kid, I love Pokemon, you know, being oh, okay. able to auto generate your own Pokemon <laughs> using style again is kind of fun. Yeah. Um, but I'm also working on a, a couple other uh, things there in terms of my, you know, non deep learning, non CS related projects. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, one of the things I've been doing recently is I've been trying to, you know, cook more because I, I'm very guilty of, you know, just eating out <laughs> if, yeah. when I'm hungry. And I found that that's actually very, uh, a good reset to the day for me when yeah. I've been working a lot on development. Yeah. That's very uh, therapeutic. I, I know. Sure. Right. It's, yeah. It's, it's amazing. Do you have a favorite dish? Favorite dish. Um, that's a good question. I like making fried rice. Fried mm-hmm. rice is like, 
It's moderately easy. You can incorporate like any number of different proteins mm-hmm. and veggies into it. Um, you can get a moderately balanced meal, although it's pretty heavy on carbs. Yeah. There are a couple of dishes that I like to make with like lettuce cups and like ground beef. <laughs> um, I'm also actually, I'm also trying to eat a lot more uh, vegetarian or uh-huh. vegan um, yeah. a couple days a week. Um, so I like making dishes with mushrooms Mm -hmm. right now. Like one of my favorites is just really plain. You know, I like to take white mushrooms like sliced, just throw them in a pan with some like avocado oil or, Mm -hmm. um, or other plant-based oil, um, and throw them in some garlic salt, salt and pepper, and then use that as like, you know, a side to whatever else I'm making. Yeah. That's just one of my like all time favorites. I I actually, before coming here, ate that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nice. Um, that's probably a good performance booster. <laughs> yeah. Um, so have you got any inspiration uh, from cooking and then l- apply that to like machine learning or like thinking or something like that? <laughs> uh, actually. Okay. So inspiration wise, maybe no, but yeah. I've definitely had like those aha moments where I'm just, you know, going through the process I'm chopping vegetables. Yeah. Um, and I think about like something that I thought that, you know, my brain's in a restive state, mm-hmm. but I, I think about something that I worked on that day and I'm like, whoa, yeah, that, that could be it. That could be the solution. Right. Um, and I've generally found that getting into like an actually good restive, like sort of restorative state mm-hmm. is pretty important for, you know, making progress. Um, like I, I have, I cannot count the number of times that I've been, uh, like reading in bed and just thought, oh my God, uh, what, what, what was I doing earlier today? This is yeah. totally the solution what I'm trying mm-hmm. to do. Um, so that's definitely like a big performance boost with respect to work, like being able to like actually like check out, yeah. but also in a sense, you're not really, you're not fully checked out. Your subconscious is working on the yeah, problem in the background. Right. Yeah. Um, so how do you structure your time? Do you have like say deep work for a few hours and then you take a break and then go back to it, have meetings, like do you have those structures of your day or it just depends? Yeah. So, um, as one interesting note, I have ADHD, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, figuring out how to organize and structure my time is very important for me being actually productive. Yeah. So like one thing that I'll do is, um, first of all, I try and structure my time so that all my meetings are in the morning and all, you know, I have a big IC block in the afternoon. I can't mm-hmm. always guarantee that. Sometimes I have days full of meetings, <laughs> yeah. but I try and structure it so I have good blocks where I can just go into deep focus, mm-hmm. um, you know, hyper-focus. One of, the, one of the things about, you know, ADHD is you sort of slip into it a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's sort of the problem, right? You're, you're hyper-focused on something. Uh, but for work, that can be very useful if you can figure out how to like yeah. get yourself in the right environment to mm-hmm. do it. Um, so for me, that means like basically removing meetings from the schedule and making sure that I, I, I don't have any like interrupts at while I'm mm-hmm. working on IC work. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of other productivity, right. Um, I found that environment is pretty important. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very guilty of, of doing work in bed and I've been trying to <laughs> decrease that recently. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, sometimes I wake up in the morning, like, I'm, I'm, or like if I'm, Late in the afternoon, I'll like mm-hmm. lie down and like try and do some of the work. And then I realize, you know, I probably should be at my desk because mm-hmm. that's where my, you know, where my, the space by which my brain associates work yeah. with. Um, oh, right, right, right. Like if you're used to that, maybe you have issues falling asleep when you're on your bed. Yeah, that, that, and, you know, I just don't feel in the same zone as when I'm mm-hmm. at my desk. So, so one thing that I'm trying to do right now yeah. is work at my desk more. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wouldn't say that I'm very, it, it's incorporated into my routine yet, yeah. but I'm, uh, you know, doing that. Uh, one other thing uh, that I found pretty useful is, is sort of going on regular walks. Mm-hmm. Like I'll walk to get food or walk to, yeah. you know, do something outside, just be outside and, and blood flowing. Uh, yeah. Instead of just staying at your desk. I found that that is, immensely helpful at like getting me reset. If yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm a runner. I used to think people who walk is so lame. Like why would I ever want to take walks? I yeah. only take walks with my parents, but I think during a pandemic, I just realized, wow, <laughs> just walk around. It's just so nice. And yeah. uh, you don't always have to like, you know, run to get your exercise. You can listen to a podcast or just sometimes I try not to listen to anything. Just yeah, kind of be I like to, I dogs. like to like unplug and, yeah. and just look around mm-hmm. and 
be present in, yeah. in the world, right? Like right. just, just look at look, like observing your environment can, you know, like figuring out, Oh, you know, maybe that mural is new or, Oh, the leaves are changing. Um, before I sort of made efforts to consciously like observe the world, like I'd sort of like go on walks and I just like kind of take a specific know, route yeah. after I've sort of made this realization that it's like a little bit better for me to sort of observe the world and go on like a random walk. Yeah. Um, like, no pun intended. Yeah, no, no <laughs> pun intended. No, no reference to deep learning here. Um, going on these random walks uh-huh. definitely does help me sort of like reset. Like yeah. I'm, I'm like, oh, observing the world, saying, oh wow, like that's new, or mm. oh, uh, you know, that's pretty, right? Like yeah. observing beauty in the world is mm-hmm. definitely something that helps me reset. Yeah, um, I think that's really important because some people feel like, oh, I have to meditate, sit there, or because if you are you know, pay attention to your breathing mm-hmm. environment. You're like in a kind of meditative state when you're taking on walks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially if, and I, uh, this is, you know, my, my friends are like, you know, wh- like, wh- what are you talking about when I say this? I, I actually like sort of the random walk specifically mm-hmm. as long as I'm, you know, you know, sh- can make my way home. Yeah. Like I'll, I'll take like a random left or a random right and just mm-hmm. say, oh, let's explore this this yeah. street. Because it's like, it's really just deferring everything to your subconscious right. or like your gut and, you know, allowing you to take in everything. Yeah. You might find a new restaurant or you're developing new neurons this way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You're, 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 ma- you're having new experiences uh, out of distribution experiences. Right. Yeah. I think with the, during the pandemic, a lot of our activity uh, uh, confined, I think that's a very creative way to find some novelty in your life and make you feel alive, feel excited. Yeah. Yeah. Did the same with biking. It also works. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you have any mentors that help you grow? I, that's a bit of an interesting question. I I don't think I've ever really had a long-term mentor other mm-hmm. than my family. Obviously, yeah. I, my family were both E's. They, they were both close to computer science. They're yeah. both deeply technical people. Mm-hmm. So they're they're very helpful. But I haven't ever really had like a long-term mentor where I sit down with the mentor and develop, Mm -hmm. um, you know, long-term goals. I'm very lucky to have grown up in Silicon Valley and sort of had access to people that I could ask questions. Mm -hmm. And I absolutely, there are absolutely people I ask questions. You know, I, I, you know, I have people that I can ask very deeply technical questions to Mm. and have interesting technical conversations with. Yeah. But to me, and this is just my definition of mentorship, mentorship is more about, having like long-term goal setting and talking about trajectory than, mm. than it is about having technical conversations. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, I don't really consider myself to have ever had a mentor mm-hmm. other than maybe my parents. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, like you mentioned, mentorship is just whatever that help you grow. So do you set aside time to define your short-term, long-term goals? Do you do that with your friend? I'm a fan of sort of making your, yourself accountable to your goals by like mm-hmm. speaking them out loud. So I say, yeah. I want to do this by this date. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it, you know, even if you don't necessarily complete it by that date, as long as you're not making like a hard commitment, like I'm hundred percent right. going to do this. this yeah. I'm going to try to do this by mm-hmm. this date. I found helps keep me motivated and yeah. accountable to myself. Mm. Um, so I definitely do go through those experiences, usually with friends or, or, you know, my sister or my, my parents or, yeah. you know anyone close by really. Yeah. I think that's really cool. It's not like, Oh, I want to do something this year. Give it a date. It doesn't have to be that specific data, but it puts a little bit direction in your mind and pulls you there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, my, the way that I would say it's like, it's like a compelling deadline, right? Like yeah. it's not really like a deadline, but having that like thought in your mind that mm-hmm. I want to have this done by this date is like important for actually incensing you to go towards it. Because if you yeah. just don't assign a date to anything, you're just mm-hmm. never going to do it. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, and uh, talk, talking about goals, uh, what are some goals uh, you want to achieve this year throughout you know, different aspects in your life you can share with us? Yeah, sure. Uh, goals, I really want to get more into long distance biking mm-hmm. or longer distance biking than what yeah. I currently do because I'll do like maybe like a six or seven mile trek and mm-hmm. not, not be, you know, it'll be like more of a time constraint. I, yeah. I want to dedicate more time to that. Mm. Um, I want to cook better, right? That's, yeah. one of, that's, that's one of my, one of my big goals. Um, professionally, I 
really think that there are a lot of grand challenges in mm. uh, tabular data right now. Yeah. Um, and I just want to be working on them, right? Like yeah. I want to, I've made it clear, you know, I've worked with my manager, worked with my team to make sure that I'm aligned mm -hmm. and make sure that I can work on what I consider these really hard challenges in deep yeah. learning. Um, and I think that that's important. Like, first of all, like align, aligning your, your work with like what you're interested in and what your personal goals are mm -hmm. and what you think is important is yeah. really important. Um, so for me, right, um, I'm going to use graph models as, as yeah. an example for why I want to work on them. Mm -hmm. I think that almost all relational data, which is almost everything, yeah. can be represented as a graph. Mm -hmm. And if we can somehow figure out how to get graph models to work arbitrarily on any graph and any relational data, yeah, um, you instantly have this powerful technique to use in pretty much any situation. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to work on. So I tell my manager and he's like, yeah, let's, let's work on this. Yeah. Um, and th that's one of my personal goals. I, I, I want to get a lot of these, I want to explore a lot of these contemporary graph models that I've read about, but haven't implemented yet. Yeah. I have a list. Um, I can't speak to it just yet, but I uh -huh. maybe, maybe on LinkedIn, I'll post something about it. Yeah. Um, uh, and in terms of other goals, uh, what else spend? I think, spending a little bit more time with like family and friends is a, is a, is a, is a good one yeah. because I can, you know, sometimes I can cloister myself and just like be like, Oh, I need to work. I can, I can only work or do stuff that I feel explicitly rests me. Mm -hmm. Um, and that sort of feels like a little bit like imprisoning, right? You're imprisoning yeah. yourself in like a tower to like get work mm -hmm. done or be, feel productive. Right. Whereas like some of the best rest you can get is just, talking to your, yeah, for me, talking to my sister who also does data science yeah. or, uh, you know, talking to my mom or dad or mm -hmm. friends or housemates. I, I have amazing intellectual discussions with my housemates. So, yeah. 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 That's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so what is, uh, I think uh, you probably talk about the graph neural network is something you're most interested in mm -hmm. like right now, right? Is yeah. it, are there something else that you feel excited about? That's a good question. Um, in contemporary research, not that I have a ton of experience in this domain, mm -hmm. I think that there are really cool things going on in the re reinforcement learning space right yeah. now. Um, last week, and you know, today is the 18th, so mm -hmm. it would be the week of, I think it was the week of the 11th. There was some really interesting work showing um, real world application of an RL agent from uh, DeepMind, if I, if I recall correctly. Yeah. They have an agent called Moo Zero that they trained to tune the bit rate for YouTube's compression. Um, and, you know, it, it showed better than the regular codex results. Yeah. So we're seeing actual applications of deep reinforcement learning affecting stuff in the real world that just isn't like stationary robotics, mm -hmm. um, which is really fascinating to me. Um, you know, I, I've always loved like AlphaGo, AlphaZero, um, uh, you know, these DeepMind works, MooZero, AlphaFold, another mm -hmm. amazing project. Computational drug discovery is like one of the things that I think will have one of some of the biggest impact on mm -hmm. uh, medicine in the next 20 years, right? Yeah. Like the ability to just very quickly search the drug space without mm -hmm. actually having to like implement the drugs yourself and yeah. use, you know, use your chemical engineering efforts to build a drug. Mm -hmm. If you can say with certainty mm -hmm. that this drug is going to have these properties before you make it, right? If your deep learning model can predict chemical structure and property, mm. then you can effectively like screen out many drugs before they're made, right? Yeah. Like you can effectively, you know, work on drugs to cure some of the maladies over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's very exciting. And uh, what do you think about the future of deep learning research? Do you think it's going to be kind of more and more specific and into some, some niche and have more and more a requirement for like uh, qualifications? Um, I think there are two expanding directions, right? There's one expanding direction that's like, oh, yeah, let's let's just make a bigger model. It'll learn more. It'll be more expressive. Mm -hmm. That is not accessible to anybody. That is yeah. accessible to very, very tenured researchers who have the, you know, engineering support and the, you know, monetary backbone to train a trillion parameter model. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be trillion parameter models. Yeah. Um, you know, Brian Catanzaro of NVIDIA, you know, there's a great video of him talking about how, like, some of the next... Uh, big models are going to be so mm -hmm. big that they're going to be like, multi, you know, super data center scale, like trillions of parameters and, you know, this is fully expressive and, and whatnot. There's also interesting research at a much smaller scale, 
right? Like distillation is a technique by which you can basically use a teacher model to mm-hmm. train a effectively similar accuracy, smaller model. Um, that's a really interesting area of research. And I think that anyone can pursue that, figuring out how to make smaller models of big models. I think that there are some domains that are becoming more dependent on, um, or there's some domains that require like a lot of niche expertise to go into, like computational drug discovery, which yeah. I mentioned, requires some knowledge of how chemistry mm-hmm. works. Yeah. Um, so it sort of depends on the task. Mm-hmm. Um, but in terms of where people in deep learning could be going, I think, I really think that there are a lot of opportunity in the deep mm. learning space still, like in terms of spots you could fill or, or things you could do. Um, that just isn't explored because we don't have enough qualified people yeah. in the space. Um, and when I say qualified, I don't mean like, you know, like completing schooling in it. I, I yeah. also mean like yeah. having strong signals that they can work in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I definitely don't think that the qualifi- qualification bar is going to go up in general across the, the domain. In fact, with more demand for deep learning at various places, we're probably going to see more openings in general. Like mm-hmm. I, I think that the percentage of openings being filled is actually going to decrease rel- relatively, right? Like the, the, the share of openings is going to get larger and the pool of potential applicants is going to get smaller mm. um, in terms of, in terms of the like qualified applicants. Yeah, that that's exciting. And uh, um, I really enjoy this conversation. I'm very impressed by your both depth and width of, you know, knowledge in deep learning. So I just feel like whatever Uh, model or topic I throw at you, you can just uh, provide so much insight. So before we wrap up, I want to ask you, are there any like skill set or uh, mindset you think that's very important that you really want to share with our audience? Continuous growth is like a, is a huge one, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I would be here today if I didn't look back and look at what I didn't like and what I didn't do well. Yeah. And you know, facing hard failures, right? Like yeah. saying like, oh, I didn't really like doing place and route at this hardware startup, doing mm-hmm. that like introspection that like you you need to change domains or yeah. or that you need to take a different approach to something mm-hmm. is like just a part of life. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think I would be here if I just settled on the first thing that I was like kind of happy with. Yeah. Um, Or if I had stopped when I was like trying something, like mm-hmm. if, I, if I had just stopped on the nth step instead of the nth, nth yeah. plus one, like I, I don't think I would have, been here mm. in terms of hard skills. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely do see like a lot of like domains getting like some very specific skill sets. Like if you want to enter Rexus, you probably do need to know about pre-processing. You probably do need to know about, you know, these set of models that are pretty unique to Rexus. Mm-hmm. If you want to enter G, D, eh, if you want to enter GNNs, you need yeah. to know about the libraries that support them like DGL or PyTorch or uh, PyTorch geometric. Yeah. Um, like, that's part of the reason that, you know, jumping back to earlier when I said like go deep in a domain, mm. once you go deep in a domain, right? If you apply to a job that's related to that domain, instead of just, you know, maybe applying saying that you have generally general deep learning experience, mm. it's so much easier for the person that's working in that domain to say, Hey, here's something useful that I see on this person's resume. Yeah. Like, Oh yeah. Like they have a project working on, you know, music recommendation. Mm-hmm. Like let's ask them about that. Yeah. Um, so like going going deep in a domain and and developing depth first, mm-hmm. um, maybe not first, but d- definitely keeping depth in mind yeah. is is a pretty key trait. Maybe not skill. Mm. Um, skill wise, you know, always of course know the frameworks, know PyTorch, know yeah. TensorFlow, know TensorFlow Extended, whatever. Mm. Uh, know your preprocessing frameworks, yeah. QDF, Pandas, PySpark. Um, Sounds like a wrap. <laughs> Yeah, a little bit like it's like it's like the it's like the the Pokemon rap, you yeah. know, like naming all the deep learning frameworks and data science frameworks. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, it doesn't necessarily have to be a list. Like, I'd, right. I'd I'd rather see, you know, like I think that I would be a stronger candidate if mm-hmm. I had always just been like, oh yeah, like here are the three core technologies that I use to get this pipeline working, right? Yeah. Rather than oh I I've taken classes on A B C D E F G, you know, like all these frameworks, mm-hmm. uh, which I see some people do, and like that may be true that you like have experienced them, but like I, there's no way that you've had the time to go in de- de- deep on them. Right. Like yeah. you, you, I'd rather see people that, you know, like built out this one workflow and learned a lot about PySpark mm. than the people that know PySpark and, uh, everything about Hadoop and, you know, yeah. a billion other Kubernetes, mm. uh, tools or 
you know, I'm, yeah. I'm just kind of spitballing here, but yeah, like, yeah, I, yeah. I'd rather see, I'd rather see like one or two things done really well mm -hmm. than like, you know, like massive breadth. Yeah. I think that's very important because a lot of times people ask me like, oh, there are like so many new tools. What should I learn? Should I do like everything? People feel stressed about it. I think just pick one or two. There's no best tool. The best tool is the one that you find it, you know, you feel more com comfortable about, you know, using to solve a problem. Sometimes people like to build uh, machine learning or even deep learning models using R. If that works for you, yeah. you solve problems that works. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like also like there's a, there's, uh, there's something I don't remember who told this to me, mm -hmm. but like the, the the one of the best things I've ever heard about this was the best tool is the one that solves the solution or yeah, the the one that yeah. takes you to a solution. Mm -hmm. So if you are working on a passion project and you're trying to choose a framework, mm -hmm. just choose like me and you know, let's say you know PyTorch and you're like, oh, should I learn TensorFlow? Well, if you think that there's something to be learned specifically about the project itself that's deep, maybe you should stick with the same framework, right? Like yeah. maybe you don't need to push yourself to uh, learn about a new framework because you're learning stuff about modeling this type of data itself, mm. right? Like yeah. you don't necessarily want or need the ability to, you know, use everything, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mostly use PyTorch in my work. I've used TensorFlow before, but you know, like the best tool for me right now to solve the problem is, is yeah. PyTorch. There's, there's always going to be a new tool. It's probably more useful to you to like go in depth and develop like the intellectual constructs about this domain than it is to choose the absolute best set of tools. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great mindset. Um, and for people who want to follow your work, um, where can people find you? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I am very <laughs> much more active on LinkedIn. Yeah. I have a Twitter. I'm trying to use it, uh -huh. but not really. Um, so LinkedIn's the best place. Okay. Um, you know, uh, people can find me just probably by searching me up by via uh, my name, Kyle Cranin. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you're interested in, you know, what my team does, of course, you, you can always find my team on our job descriptions via the name of, you know, the role, which is mm -hmm. usually deep learning algorithms and then whatever the name of the engineering role is. Um, so if you're interested in my team in that aspect, look, look that up. If you're interested in, you know, reaching out to me, I love having intellectual conversations yeah. and meeting people. So please feel free to, uh -huh. it's super fun. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn's probably the best choice. Awesome. Well, um, I really enjoyed this conversation, Kyle. Thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, also I'm excited to see your uh, new research. Maybe after a while you come back to share more uh, learnings again. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you. Thanks.